Hello, I'm Sam Slemmy. This is Isaac Spots, and this is Gareth Shepard. And we did the preliminary pneumonia detection device. So the objective for this was to reduce the influx of patients and the wait times for developing countries at local hospitals and clinics. And we know that pneumonia is a number one killer for children under the age of five. In 2015, it killed approximately a million children that year. And we want to reduce the wait times by making this device detect lung sounds fever or temperature, and SpO2 levels, because those are three biomarkers that are very indicative of pneumonia. And we would have to get this class two FDA approved, and that would be an active diagnostic device. And some of the marketing objectives that we have here, uh, Isaac Spots will talk to you about. So as he said, we would need to get it class approved first, but. Um, Essentially, we want to go to UNICEF or Red Cross and hopefully get funding from them so that we can implement it into a, a triage kit, essentially, and make it into uh, places where you can detect pneumonia earlier because that's one of the main problems is like uh, pneumonia is a very curable disease. We just don't have enough diagnostic capabilities in developing countries, and this doesn't require a doctor or a nurse to tell someone whether or not they should go to the hospital. So. That's one of our marketing goals, and uh, how, like, the cost of the device. I'll hand it over to Gareth Shepard. In terms of uh, cost of the device, buying sensors individually, like we did for our prototype, the total cost is about twenty dollars worth of sensors, and uh, various resistors and capacitors and other electronic hardware. The prototype is about twenty-five, thirty dollars. If we were to buy and produce this in bulk quantities, where we could. Uh, mass-produced printed circuit boards and uh, mass order all of the sensors, the cost per device would be closer to $25. Uh, for developing a case for this product, we we're hoping to have it injection molded, as injection molding is a good balance of repeatability, uh, cost effectiveness, and uh, general efficiency. We we're looking at uh, polypropylene plastic due to its relatively low cost, and uh, it's a good plastic to injection mold. For future add-ons to this device, we are hoping for a uh, saliva, yeah, a, a sputum, okay, as the sputum carries several important biomarkers for pneumonia. So that'll be something we'd like to look into for the future of this device. You want to say something? That's oh. it. 72 Canadian women are diagnosed with breast cancer every day. Over 28,000 women every year undergo mastectomies and lumpectomies as a preventative or treatment option for recovering from this disease. Currently, there are no devices on the market that assist individuals with monitoring their surgical wound sites at home. In Canada, if you undergo one of these surgeries, you are sent home to recover the same day. What we wanted to do at Healing Assist Incorporated is introduce a device that helps patients monitor their wound site at home. So here's our device. It's called the Mastectomy and Lumpectomy Healing Assist Bra. So what we've done is we've integrated a Flora V3 microcontroller, which was chosen because it's optimized for uh, wearable devices. Also, we have an LED, a Flora NeoPixel V2, which indicates to the patient um, when different sensors are going off. So here's our first sensor. It's a BME 280, as is this one. And what they do is they measure the temperature differential between the wound site after the mastectomy or lumpectomy and just a regular spot on the patient's back. So if the temperature difference is greater than four degrees, then um, that is a possibility for infection and the red light will go off. Also, the BME, which I'm holding right now, measures the moisture of the gauze on the patient's wound. This um, will indicate what, a blue light going off in the LED when the gauze is oversaturated, so the patient knows when to change it. Lastly, we have our um, two FSR sensors. As you can see, the blue light went off when the humidity went up. And the two FSR force sensors measure when the Jackson Pratt drainage bulb, which comes home with the patient after surgery, um, is full. And when the bulb is full, then it notifies to the patient that they need to change it. So what that does is this force sensor um, will turn the LED light yellow. Do you mind holding the back? Mm. Our device um, consumes power of 22.6 milliwatts. 
Okay, and as far as the marketing and manufacturing, we predict that we'll be able to reach 35% of our target market, meaning that we'll sell approximately 10,000 bras per year in Canada. So with that prediction of being able to sell 10,000 bras, we have our, proto our manufacturing costs of approximately $19 per bra. Uh, that cost includes all overhead, all labor, and all of our materials sold at a wholesale price. As far as our cost for retail, uh, we would sell this bra for approximately $60. Our competition sells structural support bras without any of the circuitry included for an average of $50, meaning our product has a much greater value than our competition. Hello, I'm Deanna, this is Nirvana, and this is Brandon. And we have created the Sensi Sleeve, which is a lower extremity health optimizing sleeve. So this sleeve contains sensors, um, including a humidity sensor, pressure sensors, and an accelerometer. Um, it's going to be marketed towards new amputees who just uh, need some help knowing about the current health status of their limb. Um, and more importantly, it's going to be marketed towards diabetic patients um, who have some neuropathy in their um, residual limb. So currently, there is uh, no product like this on the market that um, has a full feedback system. Um, there is one that is in preliminary process, and that is called the Socket Master. Um, but all the sensors are on the outside, on the socket, instead of the sleeve. So this will increase the cost um, for the client. So the three sensors are connected to a floor microcontroller chip. Um, there's two uh, fast force pressure sensors, so a high increase in pressure um, would ultimately cause the patient to have an uh, increase in problems in sores or discomfort and ultimately changing the gait patterns. So we want to look, uh, identify that parameter. As well as the humidity sensor is located on the posterior region of the uh, Sensi sleeve. Um, this attracts the overall humidity levels um, and moisture content in the sleeve. Uh, so odor and bacterial growth, as well as accelerometer would track the activity levels for the patient. Um, so this will be changed into uh, pronometer and number of steps in the app. Uh, this will all run through the BLE uh, Bluetooth. So it sends wirelessly information, real-time data to the smartphone. And the overall life expectancy for the Sunsea sleeve is approximately seven days. So currently we have the data going to a built-in Bluetooth app um, that is just a data log. However, this app here, this app that we developed, the Sensi Sleeve app, is what we would be using later um, to integrate into the product. It is very intuitive and easy to use for all ages. The user can visually figure out the, the progress of their parameters since the colors will change from green to red based on the real-time feedback that we're getting. Uh, moreover, they can also look at their progress by clicking the progress button that will visually as well as audibly give them a signal telling them that they're doing a good job or a warning as well as a recommendation to help them improve the specific parameters. We also have a view detail button that will show where the different pressures are distributed, um, where the sensors are placed because that will help the users find out where the pressures are um, becoming issues pretty much. So our product is very marketable because 63% of lower leg amputees um, actually do have some form of diabetes. If we were to bring it to market, we would definitely make some changes. For example, all the circuitry and the wires would be in a compact little case on the lateral side of the leg. Um, we'd also like to increase the amount of pins on our microcontroller so we could um, include some more pressure sensors um, within the sleeve. Um, and additionally, it would be a very easy to wash and to clean for the individual. Hello, this is uh, our project. It's a seizure monitoring system. Uh, this is my design team. My name is Mawad, and this is Miguel and Sam. Uh, so basically, we uh, have designed a neural cap, which is, uh, which is a cap to monitor a seizure in, uh, in the uh, epilepsy patients. So there's three types of sensors that we uh, integrated inside the cap, as you can see here. This is the prototype and the other sensors are uh, the circuits inside the box. Um, so basically it's an EEG sensor, uh, temperature sensor, and uh, accelerometer. So the basic function of this cab is to measure the different physiological uh, changes that happens for, uh, 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 for seizure patients. Uh, we did also a market analysis and we found out that uh, our project is very uh, economically feasible. Um, and that can be uh, marketable in a short period of time. And we are intended to make it as, um, as cheap as possible, just to make it affordable for people in uh, third world countries. So Miguel now gonna talk about the, uh, the circuits. 
and the software that we use for this uh, design. Thank you, Mawat. Okay, so basically some things that we had to take into consideration uh, for the design of this project was uh, the skin, uh, the skin uh, galvanic skin uh, response. In order to do that, we actually designed a, a, a system, as you can see in here. This is the final prototype. And here you can see the steps that we uh, had to do in order to get a, the proper signal uh, acquisition. Now, uh, after done that, we basic, so the main steps will be uh, the, the main signal is amplified, and it, then it goes through a series of filters, and the outcome will be the proper signal that can be measured uh, by our software. So Sam is going to be able to explain a little bit more about the, the uh, signal acquisition on the algorithm and the other sensors. Uh, so we were use, we use an Arduino for this project. Um, to do an industry uh, Fourier transform, we use an uh, open software called Processing to display the data, as you can see here. Um, so what we want is the frequency from, uh, from the EEG that we take. So uh, along with the two other sensors, which are over here, a accelerometer and a temperature device. So when, with all of them working together, you can see the temperature and the uh, acceleration are constantly being monitored here. And um, when all of them in conjunction, if there's, two, if there's a drop in temperature and there's a uh, high movement and a high frequency from the, from the EEG, then uh, it would detect a seizure and it sends a signal to the mobile phone. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and uh, do a little demonstration. So we're basically right now generating a high frequency. Here's our temperature sensor, and this is our accelerometer. So right now, basically, as you can see on the Bluetooth application, uh, it is measuring the, uh, just go a little bit closer there. Uh, it is measuring the um, object temperature, which is the body temperature. So can you hold this on me, Sam? So when the system detects a drop in temperature and also a sudden movement, like a jiggling response, Okay. The system is going to detect a seizure and it's going to send that signal and alarm to the person who is monitoring the system. Uh. Um, all right, so this is our GateMate wearable gate monitoring system with real time feedback. And basically, the purpose of it is to create a personalized coaching experience outside of the lab environment. So we do this through providing long distance runners with real time feedback and identifying running form flaws which could potentially cause injury. And so this um, it can be used to reprogram the gate. And so why are we doing this? We're doing this because 80% of runners experience lower body injuries annually. And health professionals support that through gate reprogramming, you can reduce your chances of injury. So how, we, how this works is we have two IMUs, one placed on the shank and one on the back. Along next to it is a vibration motor to send you haptic feedback. So while you're running, all the data is sent to these microcontrollers, which are programmed to know at what certain angles it will send off uh, a signal to uh, trigger the vibration motors. And we've also implemented LEDs for visual effect. So the parameters that we're looking at is the form flaws, at least. We're trying to identify overstride, knock knees, and pelvic drop. And we do that by looking at the vertical shank angle. We want it to be um, greater than zero degrees. A negative angle would indicate that you have overstride. Uh, the pelvic angle of rotation, we want to keep it under 12 degrees. And also the pelvic drop angle, you want to keep that below 12 degrees too. So as Mandy said, when those angles are identified, you're getting that haptic feedback. Um, for the final product, what we envision is having an app to go along with it, which you can see at the bottom there. And you'd also be getting audio feedback. So when you exceed those limits, you get the audio feedback telling you that you have, as well as some coaching cues. We have the coaching cues here. So if you're exhibiting knock knees, you get the coaching cue that would say, try to keep your pelvis, fr pelvis from twisting. Imagine running through a tunnel the width of your body. And that, they, that way they could correct it and slowly reprogram their gait. OK. Uh, one in three uh, cancers diagnosed uh, across the world is skin cancer. And studies have shown that if exposed to a severe sunburn before the age of 18, then your risk of skin cancer doubles. So we uh, developed a device that measures uh, your skin type, the, U the ambient UV uh, index, and uh, your hydration levels in order to safely maximize your time in the sun without overexposure to uh, the UV radiation. So our target market is young families with, uh, with children, as well as seniors, because of their vulnerability uh, to skin damage and sun damage at a very young age. 
So we'll go ahead with the demo here. Um, so, so the goal is to design um, like a wrist device. So we have the RGB sensor uh, detecting my skin uh, pig pigmentation, basically, um, as well as the UV sensor on top there to determine real-time UV. Type and Taylor here is the skin type two, so that can be correlated to our to our graph on the poster. We have our UV index, which we're able to to use our UV light here to increase, and then it'll give you a safe time that that your certain skin type is able to to spend in the in the sun. So as we saw, our UV index just increased to 4.70, and our tan time is now 40 to 65 minutes. So the way our design works is we have a, a RGB sensor which uses a 64 photodiodes to pick up the user's skin type, and then we're also using a UV sensor to pick up ambient light as the, the uh, user is going on throughout their day, and this can correlate to the safe time that, that they're allowed with the UV radiation. And we also have a GSR, which is a gal galvanic skin response sensor. And this measures uh, conductivity of the skin. And any drop in the voltage is correlated to dehydration within the user. And then a buzzer will go off so that they are able to safely hydrate themselves. Hi, uh, this is Talk Talk, uh, Tac Talk. Uh, what we have here is we've developed a prototype for a personal tactile communication device. Uh, what we've done is we've mapped pressure sensors onto the hand, which correlate to the manual alphabet used by deafblind individuals to communicate. Uh, a biggest, the biggest aim for this project was to seamlessly adapt the alphabet to the glove, so that way individuals who are afflicted uh, with this communication disability uh, are able to use the glove and convert their message to a mobile app or some sort of digital text. So we wanted to use the manual alphabet because it was well known in the community. So we didn't want to say, here's a device you can use, and also you have to learn this on top of that. So as seamless as possible was our goal. Um, there are gestures and inputs on your hand that they will know to interpret as an A or a K or an R, something like that. Uh, so that was the inspiration for where the sensors are and how the sensors are mapped out through the computer. Um, so we can talk about the market and then why we did it. Um, but we can also demo it as well. So currently, how I have my hand as it is now, uh, the input is read as off. So you're not always draining your battery with this. It's not always going to be turning on and maybe sending out messages that you're not ready to. So the moment I turn my hand over, uh, it will now change from input on. So. Yeah, so now all the sensors are activated, including the temperature sensor and the pressure sensors. And right now, Karen is just inputting letters and the glove is reading them through the pressure sensors and it's basically converting the text, um, the touch motions to text on the mobile app. This will add a space, um, so now I can type in a letter and now a space will be outputted um, and then the accelerometer is what detects turning it on and off uh, and then we also we have the temperature sensor as well so that when you're ready to send your message uh, you just blow on the device. Ready? Okay. I'm Kat, this is Sabrina, and this is Valerie, and we are the biofeedback armband, which is a presenting a carpal tunnel management and prevention device. So carpal tunnel is the most common repetitive strain injury in North America. It affects approximately 9.5 million people in the U.S. alone. Um, it's caused by an increase in internal car tar carpal tunnel pressure, which puts stress on the median nerve and causes intense pain and numbness in the hand. This happens, this is a high instance of this in people who have an office job or who have spend prolonged hours at a computer per day and it causes approximately a loss of $15,000 in earnings per year. So we just decided to create this device because there are, the current market today for carpal tunnel treatment are invasive surgeries, um, ineffective splinting and f expensive physiotherapy. Our device is trying to combine the three of those and um, instead of having a splint, it will provide corrective instantaneous feedback to people on their ergonomic placement. Um, this is not a diagnostic device, it's more of a pain management device and prevention device for people with carpal tunnel. So it does this by measuring the three factors that are most likely to increase carpal tunnel pressure. These are wrist orientation, 
force on the palm and also grip force. So more specifically, it uses an inertial measurement unit to measure wrist extension and radial deviation. Also, force sensors to measure the force on the palm and uh, an electromyography quantifies the grip force in the forearm. So, it uses a, uh, a wearable microcontroller and Bluetooth technology to send these values as well as written commentary directly to your phone. But not everyone has time to be looking at their phone all day, so it also has a built-in vibration motor that will notify you if any of these biomarkers exceed the, uh, the recommended threshold for more than five seconds. So using this, you can always be assured that you're in proper ergonomic position at all times. So our device will be marketed to people that are 25 years or older who work in occupations that are very desk heavy, very computer heavy, and require a lot of writing. This makes up approximately 48% of today's workforce. Our device will be introduced to the market by partnering with physiotherapists and ergonomic assessment companies. The physiotherapists and ergonomic assessment companies will recommend the device to their clients regardless if they have been formally diagnosed with carpal tunnel syndrome or not. Our device will be, sorry, our device will cost $40.50 per unit for 10,000 units, uh, to many, per unit to manufacture 10,000 units, and we expect to sell 10,000 units in our first year of production. We will sell each unit for $90, and our head manufacturing site and distribution site will be in Mississauga, Ontario. So now we'll do a demonstration. So I'm just gonna pull out the app here, and, so disconnecting. Okay, so as you can see, Sabrina is in a very uh, neutral position and the phone is reading that at such. She has safe joint angles, the force on her hand is okay, and her grip is okay. So if she gives a squeeze, you can see that she needs to release her grip. And if she does that for long enough, the vibration motor will go off. So it will be a discreet um, notification that she needs to change her position. So that is the CTS. Um, biofeedback, biofeedback armband, and we'd be happy to take any questions. Hi, welcome to Help Sense Guelph. My name's Harrison. Um, I'm Neha, and uh, this is Julia. <laughs> and today we're going to be talking about a wearable stress monitoring device for children with speech and language disorders. So the market of uh, wearable stress monitors for adults is widely explored, although we don't see this the same with uh, children's stress wearables. Um, so there's a large issue with children that have stress and communication disorders that are unable to relate how exactly they feel and how the stress is affecting them. So long-term exposure to stress for children can result in uh, physiological and sociological impacts. So we see this with increased heart rate, tantrum behaviors, panic disorders, and an inability to uh, relate to, communica uh, to communication, to community and uh, school atmospheres. And this is where HelpSense comes in. All right, so HelpSense is a non-invasive uh, wrist-worn sensor that measures stress biomarker data um, and uh, outputs that to an app. Um, we believe that providing a quantifiable output of stress is very important to caregivers because it leads to meaningful intervention, especially if the child is unable to talk and they are very young. To monitor these biomarkers, our device is composed of three sensors. So we have the galvanic skin response sensor, which just measures the electrical impedance of the skin. And we have an infrared thermometer, which measures the body temperature in Celsius. And we have the pulse sensor, which measures the heart rate in beats per minute. And then this communicates with the Arduino, which sends data to the Blue Smurf, uh, the Bluetooth module, which then uh, sends the data to the phone app. And if there's any stress indicators, an SMS message will be sent to another device indicated as the caregiver. In this case, it is just my group members. All right. So typically what happens during a stre high stress state response is that body temperature and heart rate will increase while galvanic skin response will decrease. Um, however, these uh, values are unique to each child. So we have included um, a stress detection algorithm uh, which calibrates the unique thresholds of the child and then takes deviations from that baseline um, and uh, uh, predicts the stress level based on the initial values. Um, of course, future uh, developments of the app will involve a uh, machine learning uh, algorithm, which will make stress prediction much better. 
So this device will be marketed to clinicians, physicians, um, any primary caregiver, teachers, parents, and so um, our device occupies a niche market. So 0.6% 0.6% of Canadian youth suffer from a, de a developmental disorder, and a further 2.3% experience communication disorders. So this is a very wide art market that we feel that we're able to uh, penetrate successfully. Uh, the cost of our prototype was $100, and the cost bringing to market associated with all the manufacturing costs, bulk discounts, uh, employee costs, is a total of $150. This is very competitive. Other companies charge a monthly installment fee where ours does not. You're simply just paying for an effective hardware system that works, and we're extraordinarily competitive in the market. Um, our sensors that we used are unparalleled um, and very novel. Um, thank you very much. We are HelpSense. Uh, awesome. Good. Uh, hi, I'm Grace. This is Jesse and Zoe, and we present to you Helmatech, a real-time concussion, concussion alert system. So 1.6 to 3.8 million concussions occur in sports annually in the U.S. alone. So a lot of these concussions occur in young players who don't always know uh, the severity that concussions ha are and how to recognize their symptoms. So having this device will allow people to catch concussion symptoms early and possibly save someone's life. So Helmetech is an integrated real-time monitoring system, so it has sensors inside that will allow it, them to all be sent to a mobile application and that will, someone will be able to read like a trainer. Also, there's a visual notification system on the back um, that everyone on the, in the ring can see, such as coaches, referees, other players, and this will allow them to spot a player who has, has a, is at risk of a concussion and should be further assessed. So there are four sensors around the helmet. There are four on the inside, and then also an accelerometer, and this is used to measure the motion of the head. So this information is used to determine whether a player has reached a force that's either at a warning or an urgent threshold or a dangerous level of acceleration. So on the helmet, as you can see, if there is an, a warning level of acceleration or of force, sorry, there's a yellow notification. If there is a dangerous or an urgent level of force, there's a red notification. And if there's dangerous acceleration, the notification turns blue. There's also an application with this helmet and it shows which location um, is receiving the force on the helmet. So it shows the front, back, left, and right. So as you can see, if one of the four sensors is simulated, the front you can tell on the app. This information is very useful for doctors to diagnose concussions, as knowing the location of where the impact is taken has been proven to be very beneficial in the diagnosis. So Helmetech will be positioning itself as an accessible tool for safety-conscious youth teams and it is expected that it'll be the team's trainer who is using the mobile app. These consumers, our target markets, will be specifically high school teams, university level teams, and any youth hockey league. So these consumers might not have the knowledge to diagnose concussions, however, they will be interested in monitoring them with a simple device that connects right to their smartphone. So these consumers probably won't have access to the amenities that professional players do, such as professional trainers, or extensive concussion, um, extensive concussion research or training. However, so Helmetech will be the tool that they need, the technological edge so that they can monitor their players and effectively see if they have been, they have been affected by traumatic brain injuries. Thank you for your time. We designed the Railway Wheel Integrated Steering Wheel System, which is designed to detect and prevent drowsy driving. Our goal was to design a system that would ve uh, measure various human health parameters, and then if you're below a certain threshold, then it'll tell you that you're in a state of decreased awareness. Drowsy driving is the third highest cause of vehicular collisions on the road, and therefore there exists this need for some device that mitigates this issue. Our device will be marketed towards long distance truck and bus drivers. So when you're about to fall asleep, three things happen. Your pulse decreases, your grip on the steering wheel loosens, and the frequency of the micro adjustments that you're making to stay in your lane, that also decreases. So we've got a pulse sensor, a force sensor, an accelerometer, um, and from there they will communicate with an Arduino, which if you're below a certain threshold will turn on a blue light. So blue light has been known to decrease the, the um, inhibit the release of melatonin, that's the sleep-inducing hormone. So we're going to show you how it works. 
So right over here, this is the force sensor along the top. Behind here is the pulse sensor and the accelerometer is at the back. Okay, so basically what we did is if you release the pressure on the wheel for over 30 seconds or you do not have a pulse for over 30 seconds, the blue light will turn on and the accelerometer, we have it more sensitive at 10 seconds. So the 30 second delay allows for the driver to reach over and change the radio without the lights just turning on and being annoying. And we decided that the accelerometer was the most important and factor because if you're not moving the wheel at all, then are you really driving attentively? So with all of these sensors together, we have the fully integrated steering wheel. And in future generations, we are going to include a speaker. We were not able to do this with the lack of technology available with the current Arduino. And we also are going to integrate an eye tracking so that if you blink or your eyes close for a longer period of time, then the lights will also turn on and an alarm. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jordan. Uh, this is my partners, Prathen and Sheldon. And we made the Guardian, which is a vestibular system guidance headset for the blind. So essentially what we're trying to do is, for people who can't see, who are visually impaired, we've designed this headset uh, to guide them. And how it guides them is it uses a camera in the front to detect any objects coming in front of them. It uses a teensy microcontroller, which has nine axes measurement, which would measure the pitch on roll. So essentially it's a flight controller that will be on their head. And then based on that, that will be sent to a Raspberry Pi, which is inside, which will combine the data coming in from the video feed and the nine axes measurement to say, okay, is there an object coming in front of me? And how do I best avoid that? So how we do that, though, is the, the actual product won't have uh, LEDs, they'll have electrodes. And what we do is val galvanic vestibular stimulation, which Pratham will go a little bit into why we chose it and how it works. So galvanic vestibular stimulation, or GVS, is a non-invasive uh, perturbation technique that modulates uh, neural firing beneath the mastoid bone. So when you attach electrodes such as these right here, you, they'll be placed right underneath the ear and then grounded on a bony prominence such as the mastoid bone and uh, our headset also includes a camera system to pick up the obstacles that the, the user will be trying to avoid and then the electrodes like I mentioned will be placed uh, underneath the mastoid bone and on a bony prominence and then uh, it also includes a nine axis sensors which uh, have three axes from the magnetometer three axes from the gyroscope and three axes from the accelerometer. Now Sheldon will talk about the marketing objectives. Uh, so initially applying uh, market analysis, uh, we obviously want this to be applied to all visually impaired individuals with a specific focus on people who are late blinded. Uh, that's just a sudden onset, so people who've had vision their whole lives and then suddenly they don't anymore. Uh, that would be really applied for this project. Um, so mostly this project is uh, usually caused by uncorrected refractive air, um, which, uh, as you'll see here, causes uh, a loss in the global economy of $269 billion per year. Um, and then for this specific market price of this device right here, um, the prototype itself costs about $200 to make, and uh, we're going to mark it up for $500. And uh, Pratham will show you a video of uh, a little shuffling here. So as, you so as you can see in the video, uh, if Pratham moves that over, this is the region of interest. So this is directly in front of the person, and this adjusts with as they move their head around. So this is a static input right now. And what this is doing is it's detecting within this region, it's going to apply different filtering techniques using OpenCV, which is an open source image processing platform. And at any time an object passes within the region of interest, it's going to detect it and determine, okay, is it further to the right or left, and how do I get around it? Um, and then that will be executed through the electrode or in the LEDs here. Thanks so much, we appreciate it. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll see the Guardian soon. Thanks. Hi, my name is Anjana Renduwe. This is Patricia Wilczewski and Caitlin Yam. We are group number 13 and our final project we have designed is a minimally invasive wrist-worn seizure alert device. Uh, first off, the technical functionality of our device includes acquiring clinically relevant sensor data uh, in terms of electromyography, uh, electrodermal activity, and acceleration. We'll be using three sensors, the galvanic growth module, malware muscle sensor, and the uh, accelerometer. 
Uh, that we believe that this will further reduce the occurrence of false alarms as well as allow clinicians to more conveniently seek immediate medical attention. In terms of marketing objectives, our device will primarily focus on targeting individuals who respond poorly to anti-seizure medications. Um, according to studies, this represents one-third of the population demographic. And this will give families and caregivers peace of mind during the night. Further, essential sensor modules will also put our product above current technologies who lack in the number of sensors that they use. So now we'll do... Uh, so some current tech, uh, technologies in the market is called Embrace, which only uses two sensors. Our device uses three, um, along with the EDA for skin resistance, as well as the accelerometer, which the Embrace device uses. We have uh, electromyography, which me measures muscle contractions. With these three sensors, we can severely increase our um, reliability. Um, now we'll show you a demonstration. You can see the Bluetooth is on, and uh, here's our mobile platform. And you would connect to the Bluetooth as a receiver. So the Bluetooth is connected. So now we have the Bluetooth connected. And then the alert. And this is all real, real-time data that's coming in from the sensors. So I am Jonathan Mazursky, and with me is Lydan Murray and Morgan Kelly, and we are Group 14. Uh, we have developed the heat stroke harness, which is a device for uh, detecting early warning signs of heat stroke, as well as preventing heat stroke in brachycephalic dogs. Brachycephalic dogs are dogs with shortened snouts, um, and include breeds such as boxers, bulldogs, and pugs who are at an increased risk of chronic illnesses uh, like brachycephalic obstructed airway syndrome. Now, this occurs when their esophagus becomes elongated and obstructs their breathing, which puts them at an increased risk of heat stroke due to a reduced ability for them to cool themselves. Um, heat stroke can be measured by an increase in breathing rate, temperature, and heart rate, and these symptoms often go unnoticed by the owners and can prove very harmful or even fatal to the dog. So we designed the heat stroke harness to be able to measure the dog's vital signs and alert the owner if the animal is overheating. So we used a monolithic temperature sensor, which is right around here, to measure its temperature. We used an amped pulse sensor, which is here, to measure its uh, pulse. And we used a flex sensor on the abdomen to measure its respiratory rate. So if the animal's temperature gets up to 39 degrees Celsius and its breathing rate gets up to 300 breaths per minute, or its heart rate gets up to 170 beats per minute, then the LEDs will turn from green to red, alerting the animal's owner that the animal is in trouble and allowing the animal to cool down. The heat stroke harness will be marketed towards Gen X and Y brachycephalic dog owners. Research has proven that owners who find their pets to be family members are more likely to spend money on the animals. Um, this target segment that we chose are those owners as compared to baby boomers who don't view their animals in the same way. Um, the Gen X and Y target segment is also more technologically advanced and we believe would be more likely to spend the money on a biosensor device to save to improve the lives of the brachycephalic dogs. Um, the manufacturing cost of the product is $45 per unit and we would sell it at a cost of $169.99, giving our company a profit margin of 73.5%. The heat stroke harness would be sold through veterinarians and clinics and then online through social media and online advertisements. Uh, as a group, we believe that the heat stroke harness could improve the lives of brachycephalic dogs. Now Jonathan's going to demonstrate. Okay. So we have the... Oh, hold on. The lights aren't on at all. Can we try... Okay. Sure. So when the dog has its regular vital signs, um, all of these green lights are on, indicating that the dog is in good, healthy condition. However, when the dog's breathing rate and temperature increase beyond a certain threshold, the lights should turn red to indicate that the dog has gone into uh, an at-risk vital condition. And ideally, there, oh, there we go, just a little bit faster, and there. And as the breathing rate slows down again, 
lights will resume to green as soon as it detects that the dog is in a stable condition again. If you go to St. Joseph's Healthcare, you see physiotherapists and occupational therapists moving from room to room, just moving patients around so they don't develop pressure ulcers, which are caused by just stagnant sitting or stagnant like laying down on a bed. This is a three mil, this, 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 problem, uh, 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 this problem affects three million people and it's 11 billion industry. And yours are a solution to this problem. A pressure ulcer preventing wheelchair seat that will optimize its pressures because it's adaptive and smart and reduce pressure ulcers in wheelchair patients. So our solution is an automatic pressure uh, variable seat. And it's automatic because um, some wheelchair patients don't have feelings underneath their waist and they won't be able to tell when they have pressure ulcers. And so our solution is to redistribute the pressure underneath them by reinflating and deflating um, air pockets. So what makes our system smart and better than our competitors is we use various metrics to identify the key areas of risks um, for pressure ulcers. And using that information, we optimize the seat geometry to help prevent that from happening. Now, there are similar products on the market. Um, which are used for bed sores. However, there hasn't been a smart system developed for a wheelchair. Now, the good thing about having uh, a significantly similar product on the market is Health Canada and FDA approval is much easier to get because they've gone through all that process for us. Now we will give you a quick demo. With all the ADP and assisted development programs and insurance policies that are in place in America and Canada, this device will not cost a lot to the consumer. It costs roughly $150 and doesn't affect the performance of powered wheelchairs that much. But it provides a much better lifespan and, and li life for the p average patient. So the, the two metrics that I described. So the two metrics that I described, the first is pressure sensing. So when I put this on, it might be a little bit difficult to see on the video, but this quadrant is depressurizing. So that is allowing for the reperfusion of blood flow in that area. Now, when I take it off, it reinflates. Now, Alan over here is demonstrating the temperature capabilities of this. So when the thermistor that is underneath here gets cold enough and identifies that temperature, what it will do is it's going to deflate this quadrant. It may be a little bit difficult to see in the video, um, and I think that's going right now, if you can hear it. Um, but basically, that is um, when you have an r area of reduced blood flow, which is a risk uh, factor for pressure ulcers, you will see that reduce in temperature. Good. Our product looks to address muscle spasms in multiple sclerosis patients. Multiple sclerosis, or MS, is a neurodegenerative disease that affects the nervous system, muscles, and the heart. Our product, the Neuromuscular Electrostimulation Sleeve, or NMES Sleeve, looks to address this problem by monitoring the user's muscle activity through EMGs. This data is sent to our microcontroller where the data is processed, and if a muscle spasm is detected, an electrical shock is sent to the user's muscles to relieve and relax the user's muscles. So this is the NMES prototype device. As you can see for this demonstration, it is on my arm. You can see the EMG muscle spasm detector right there. So when a muscle spasm, which is a maximum voluntary contraction, um, is detected, it, it sends a signal to the processing unit, which then relays back to our vibrating motor disc. This motor disc acts as our electrical simulation, and it serves to relieve the muscle of its spasm pain. All this information is transmitted via Bluetooth to a phone application we have. It monitors the system's temperature, so it poses no threat to the customer for overheating the device, and also monitors the EMG muscle um, signals for the contractions. Presently, multiple cirrhosis affects 2.1 million people globally. Interestingly enough, in northern countries, um, there are significant more cases of multiple cirrhosis. So in Canada alone, there are 291 cases of multiple cirrhosis per 100,000 people. The expected market for NMES revenue is expected to increase by 4.5% of compound annual interest rate between the years 2017 to 2016. That's an expected revenue gain of 600 million to 800 million. million.
Over the long term, we would like to build relationships with our customers, um, collaborate with sister companies in order to grow into other markets, and bring NMES to the forefront of neuromuscular therapy. Thank you. Our price, also our price, will be $175 for the unit. Hi, so we have developed a diagnostic water quality sensing device. Uh, so we were pushed by a company out in Calgary called Friendsense Technologies, which currently detects arsenic concentration in water using E. coli. Uh, they've had issues with accuracy of their tests because their water has been, had different conductivities and different pHs, which has messed with the bacteria and their environment. Uh, so to that end, they asked us to uh, develop a calibration device for them, and we've done that. So we have... Uh, incorporated a pH sensor, an electrical conductivity sensor, and a thermistor or temperature sensor. All of this then sends data back to the Red Bear microcontroller which is housed in here. It processes that data and then sends it over Wi-Fi uh, to a smartphone app uh, so that it can read out that data. So I'll get that going while my group members talk about the uh, marketing side. Hi. Um, so according to the global water quality um, sensor market report, um, the water quality sensors, um, the market is increasing by 4.54%. Um, and this, the reason for this is that a lot of government um, organizations are actually investing more money into uh, water pollution. And a lot of third world countries are industrializing as well as urbanizing. So they are investing more money into water quality devices. So the selling point for our product is that it's very cheap. It costs us about $78 to create this device um, because a lot of the components are on the cheaper end. And if you were to buy the components in bulk, it would cost even less to create this device. Um, another selling point for our product is that it has Bluetooth and Wi-Fi components, which means that it can be used in remote areas and you can receive your data um, at your working location. Hi, I'm Sankit. I'm in fourth year uh, engineering systems and computing. My name is Andre and I'm in fourth year biomedical engineering. And my name is Bargo and I'm also in bio biomedical engineering. And we're Jab Systems. So at Jab Systems, we specialize in implementing engineering uh, systems concepts and bioinstrumentation design principles into creating medical devices and communication systems that can make uh, meaningful uh, impacts on the world. So every year, uh, Large-scale disasters happen around the world, which place large strain on medical facilities and on the medical first response systems. Uh, current, current methodologies for triaging include paper tracking and radio communication. So our solution to this problem is to create a device which can quickly and effectively uh, measure the key vital signs in triage and communicate this information between other first responders and transportation and hospitals as well. And through our extensive research, we have found that the three main uh, vital signs which are used in triage are uh, heart rate, blood oxygen, and respiratory rate, all of which can be detected using the sensors we have created for our, for our uh, system. And for, as an example, a large-scale disaster which happened recently is a major earthquake in central Mexico, which has resulted in the lives of around 370 people, and we feel that we can reduce uh, this number, which may have been caused due to improper triaging techniques or uh, triage techniques which may have taken a long time to do. What, what separates our product from other competition is that we provide real-time wireless feedback straight from the vital sign instrumentation kit directly to the mobile application of the first responder. Not only is this real-time, it, uh, it also doesn't depend on the experience and skill of the first responder for acquiring these, uh, these vital signs. In addition, uh, the first responders can then create patient profiles which are then transported to hospitals and hospitals can actually prepare for the patients uh, coming in before they actually arrive. This, this allocates the resources effectively and reduces the total triage time. Uh, finally, in the, in the global triage world, uh, systems tend to use a more traditional approach and when competition applies their new systems, they tend to have a high learning curve. With this high learning curve, first responders don't use the systems effectively and are not uh, adopted uh, as a result. Our design was, uh, was made to minimize the interaction between the first responders and the uh, triage system itself in order for it to be easily implemented and uh, adjusted to any triage model that exists. So our current triage system consists of a pulse oximeter, a respiratory mask, and the main control unit, which uh, Andre will display as the patient. 
So right now, uh, Bargo is putting the mask on Andre, and he's gonna put the pulse oximeter on. And we created our own Bluetooth app that can receive the data in real time. So right now, I'm gonna connect to the app, connect to the device via Bluetooth, it's paired, and we should be getting real time data signals. As you can see, uh, as uh, Andre's, uh, Andre breathes, his respiration rate goes up, and it's currently calculating his heart rate. It takes a couple of seconds to get the accurate reading. So as you can see, Andre's heart rate right now is 66 beats per minute, and his respiration rate is 42, and his blood oxygen level is uh, 98%. Um, after, or while the sensor is running, the medical first responder can perform basic triaging uh, assessments for trauma. And once their trauma assessment is done, we can actually create a patient profile on the app. So in, in helping to identify the patients coming to the hospital, we have a feature which we can take a picture of the patient. So I'm gonna take a picture of Andre. And as you can see, Andre's uh, picture will be sent with his patient uh, profile. And once that's done, the, the medical first responder can uh, type in what any uh, trauma the patient has incurred. And the final stage would be to select a triage condition, whether it be stable, minor, and urgent. And these are dependent on the conditions uh, li listed on our poster here. And the, the final step is to send this data to the hospital where they can uh, start effectively uh, preparing for patients to come in and give them the proper medical treatment that they need. This is our device, so what we created was a complete posture monitoring system. Um, yeah, so we have a sonar sensor built in that looks at your, uh, the distance from your face to the screen. Um, in typical office working conditions, you're always looking at a computer and this causes eye strain, so we're trying to reduce that. Next we have a pressure sensor underneath where your wrist go for carpal tunnel syndrome. And then lastly we have an accelerometer, gyrometer, gyroscope on the, um, on the patient himself and this measures and calibrates to you and looks at your upright posture. Uh, so my name is John. I'm just going to go into a bit about the background information that we gathered based on uh, journal articles and stuff uh, and how we got our calibrated ranges. So from uh, medical reviews we looked at, um, we found that as you can see here on our poster, negative 0.5 to 0 megapascals is the range that we want to be in in terms of uh, disc pressure on the lumbar region. So based on that, uh, our device is calibrated that if you lean too far forward, so this way, or too far laterally on either side, a sensor will go off and you'll go back to a neutral posture. Uh, we also looked and we found that um, within 20 inches of the screen, we can see anisopia, which is eye strain. So anywhere closer than 20 inches, eye strain can develop. So we have a sensor that goes off telling you to go back to the neutral position. And then last off for uh, wrist flexion extension when typing, if there's too much pressure on the wrist, as you can see from this graph here, that uh, carpal pressure increases and there's a risk of carpal tunnel syndrome. And uh, if there's too much pressure, it'll tell the user to uh, release and go back to that neutral position as well. And uh, we're just gonna give a quick demonstration of what a typical office space would look like in an office worker, how they would perform it. So you can see it's very simple. We have the three different sensors. So this is a distance sensor. So you can see when I come through close to the screen, that blue light is illuminated. Right, close to my personal. right here. And the blue light illuminates when I come too close. And the keyboard is calibrated for the force of how much your wrist is. So now if I apply too much pressure with both hands, you wanna hold you it? Yeah, yeah. So the red LED is going off representing he, he's putting too much pressure on the keyboard. And you can keep going, I can talk about it if you So that would demonstrate his lumbar posture. So if he exits the ranges that would be calibrated, it might've messed up a little bit just cause he was leaning already from the start. But, uh, from the set point, it would calibrate, it would, the LED would go off if you're slouching too much. The LED would also go off if you're sliding to the left or right too much. And that would represent the lumbar ranges that we calibrated. PSPRA Incorporated, and we will be presenting the Safe Lit. Over the course of my time as a beach volleyball coach, I noticed that kids don't drink enough water and they never remember when to reapply sunscreen. After some further research, we discovered that dehydration and sunburns can be very damaging to a child's health and can continue to affect them into adulthood. We also discovered that 90% of uh, missing children cases are actually not abductions, but rather lost children or runaways.
So we decided to add a GPS to the device so parents would be able to discover or find their child when they're lost sight of them. The SafeLit consists of three sensors, three LEDs, and sends information through a wireless app. It reminds the child and sends alerts to uh, the parent. The green light flashes to remind the child to drink water. The yellow light flashes to remind the child to reapply sunscreen. These reminders are generated by temperature, humidity, and UV intensity uh, detected by the bracelet. The parent can view these conditions and the location of the child through a wireless app. The red light will flash and an alert will be sent to the phone uh, when the child is un in unsafe conditions. The device is waterproof, dirt proof. The, yeah, the device is waterproof, dirt proof, and the, will last a full day on a single charge. The, the device starts at $110, but additional features are available, such as an LCD screen or SMS communication for an additional price. A contest will be held to decide the final design aesthetics of the project. The children can submit their own interpretations of how the device should look, and the best, the best concepts will be selected in the final design aesthetics. We also hope to obtain the rights to, to utilize popular superheroes and TV characters in our products so that kids will love wearing the device. Uh, this is, I'm Simran, this is Emily, and that's Zubi. Our product is a non-invasive diagnostic tool for measuring uh, melanoma. And we pair the principles of uh, electrical impedance spectroscopy and near-infrared spectroscopy to develop the first non-invasive home diagnostic uh, tool for melanoma. Uh, we looked into a lot of parameters uh, and then uh, finalized uh, EIS and NIRS as they were the most uh, used in research and we had more proof and uh, background to support our analysis. Uh, electrical impedance spectroscopy works by the principle of, so we put the um, electrodes on our skin like further away to calibrate healthy skin and then on the lesion to measure uh, the electrical impedance of the uh, lesion. And um, so if the um, impedance of the uh, lesion is uh, less than that of healthy skin, then it uh, gives you a result on our app that uh, malignancy uh, is prominent and you should go see a specialist. And the other is NIR and my teammate. So we decided to use NIR uh, to detect the blood chromophores. Uh, so we picked two specific wavelengths to detect deoxy and oxyhemoglobin. And it works by you hold your hand, or you, you hold the skin adjacent to the lesion over the near infrared light, and it takes a calibration for your healthy skin. Uh, it relates, so the wavelengths penetrate at different depths. So you calculate the change in uh, optical density. Then you can calculate your um, blood oxygenation level under the lesion because cancerous tissue is uh, characteristic of areas of hypoxia. And then once you have your blood oxygenation levels, uh, we, re, uh, we go into the app, we calculate the absorption coefficient, and an elevated absorption coefficient will be indicative of cancer when you compare it to the healthy parameter that you took earlier uh, during the reading. Then my colleague will explain our business plan. As uh, far as our business plan goes, we have a de developed product right now. So there's three main aspects we have to worry about. It is the development of our product, how we're going to manufacture our product, and getting a Health Canada approved. As far as uh, research and development, first we have to integrate the complicated circuitry of the breadboard onto flexible PCBs and place it on adhesive wearable patches. Secondly, we are going to create a product line of uh, skin diagnosis tools for uh, BCC and SCC, which is non-melanoma skin cancers. And uh, all we have to do is alter the parameters of the impedance spectroscopy as well as the infrared spectroscopy to meet those standards. And for manufacturing costs, initially, we're going to outsource our manufacturing to the U.S. Uh, we found an estimate online of how much it would cost to create our entire product on a PCB. And so it's approximately $4.50. Uh, with the electrodes and uh, the skin patch, would be a total uh, uh, manufacturing cost of $5.50. And then we would uh, make like a 50% markup, a 500% markup to get a market price to ensure an optimal profit. And uh, as far as the Health Canada approval, we would just have to meet FDA standards and, ex and other standards to get our product on the market. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. My name's Camila, this is Brenda, and this is Megan, and we are presenting Climacterra. Climacterra Packaging Solutions aims to reduce food spoilage of climacteric fruits, specifically the avocado. 
Unfortunately, avocados experience a rapid post-harvest deterioration like most other climacteric fruits. Approximately one in six of all the purchased produce in Canada spoils before consumption, and each individual is estimated to throw away 123 kilograms of fruits and vegetables due to spoilage each year. This is both an economic and sustainability issue that needs to be addressed. Climactera is based on the concept of aerobic cellular respiration by monitoring carbon dioxide, room temperature, and relative humidity within the container. During the process of cellular respiration, the carbohydrate in the fruit is broken down into its constituent parts and reacts with atmospheric oxygen to produce carbon dioxide, water, and energy. Uh, avocados experience a climacteric stage in which there's a great increase of cellular respiration and th they, there's a peak that occurs at room temperature that is at approximately 120 milliliters of, of carbon dioxide per kilogram per hour. And studies show that this peak precedes the onset of fruit ripening by one to three days. So the current products on the market today are more um, modified atmospheric products where they alter the conditions within the container and they try to do, reduce the rate of cellular respiration. For our product, we chose to strictly monitor the state of the fruit and not alter any atmospheric um, pressures within the container. So for our product, the prototype currently cost us $115 to produce, although using bulk sensor costs, it can get reduced to $45 and it would retail at $59.99. Um, this would leave a 25% profit margin and approximately a two-month payback period for the consumer. Our current product targets household avocado monitoring, although um, it has the potential to expand to other, other fruits and um, commercial applications. Uh, Climax Terra aims to reduce the amount of food waste and increase food sustainability. Okay. Hi. Hi, my name is Zach. And I'm May, and we are PHMS, and we've designed a poultry health and welfare monitoring system for the monitoring of environmental conditions and chicken responses in broiler barns. So we focused on broiler barns, or broiler chickens, and those are chickens raised for meat. They're raised at a rate of 50 billion chickens a year worldwide. It's a huge industry. And in the U.S. alone, this, uh, this industry, as well as other livestock production, deals with economic losses of $2.36 billion every year from animal stress. Broiler chickens are particularly susceptible to this if the environmental conditions in their barns are not kept within tight ranges. To deal with this, we created a solution, an integrated system with commercialized sensors to detect temperature, relative humidity, dust concentration, and a microphone to detect parameters and chicken responses within the barn. So we created a library here of various thresholds as well as call signal processing to detect um, calls from chickens that, det that indicate fear, thirst, hunger, or even something like mental stress. So using this library, um, we are able to go and hear from the barn, the microphone in the barn, and get that signal and bring it back, match it to our library, and then see whether or not there is a stressor present. Additionally, this is the technology which makes us stand out from the rest of our competitors. The microphone element is missing in a lot of common centers nowadays, and this is a, allows the farmer to have real-time I'm sorry, um, to have real-time signal information um, and enable, to enable him to optimize conditions within the barn. We also have a wireless app available, which has um, data which updates, as well as giving us warnings if we approach those thresholds. Uh, it is our intention to market this product towards large-scale large scale facilities, as the 20 largest firms in Canada make up 92% of the market alone. Uh, we currently, uh, our current market competitors price their products at around $1,000 or more, while we have been selling ours at $300 at an initial first year production cost of $84. This gives us a net profit of $216 per unit. Uh, as the poultry industry continuously uh, demands stricter and stricter regulations, we believe in the next five to ten years that these regulations will require the implementation of monitoring su systems such as ours. So our system reflects where we believe the market will be in the future. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Jacob, and these are my partners, Justin and Rupreet. Uh, and we're here to represent the Hamstring Adjustable Compression System, or HACS, as we like to call it. Um, so the main problem we're trying to tackle here is um, optimizing the recovery process of hamstring injuries. Hamstring injuries account to 
for 12 to 16 percent of all injuries among athletes, so they are very common. Uh, as well as have uh, the largest problem uh, concerning the hamstring injuries is that they have a very high recurrence rate. Uh, one third of these injuries usually recur within the first year, and they're usually more severe than the first time around. Uh, so uh, our main objective here is to design a system that can provide you live feedback with key parameters that help you optimize the recovery prog progress of hamstring injuries, as well as apply variable compression, which is one of the, the key things to treating hamstring injuries. So our design is mainly based off of the most common rehabilitation method for hamstring injuries, uh, known as RICE, and that stands for rest, ice, uh, compression, and elevation. So we decided that it would be really important for us to include metrics or parameters on all of these things. So for rest, we decided to track the number of ste steps, and we did that using a self-made pedometer using a tilt sensor. Um, for ice, it's really important to reduce the temperature of the affected area and so we included a thermocouple in our design, which actually measures uh, the body temperature, or skin temperature, sorry. Uh, compression. So we actually have two FlexiForce sensors in our design, as well as two stepper motors. And the stepper motors allow the user to have variable user-controlled compression. Um, and you can adjust that based on your level of comfort. And the FlexiForce sensors are used to help indicate whether the amount of compression that you have on your leg is safe or not. The last uh, metric that we have is elevation status. So we use a tilt sensor for that as well. And basically, based on the orientation of the tilt sensor, we can determine whether the leg is elevated or not. All right, and I just wanted to touch on um, a couple of the really neat innovations that we have inside the project right now. Um, one of the main uh, issues that we had with this project was our space constraints. So. We've got a big Arduino mega board in here. It covers almost all the space inside this box, and we've got big 9-volt batteries on either side. So in order to save space and eliminate another big component, the breadboard, we went ahead and 3D printed these sort of mini breadboard type devices here that uh, we stick our motor drivers and op amps into, and then we can construct a circuit that'll actually fit inside this smaller uh, enclosure there. So that was one really awesome innovation that we did for this project. Um, Another was our pedometer, as Rupri touched on before. So we're actually just using a simple tilt ball sensor. Um, and what it does is, as it switches orientation from one way to the other, it checks the time in between that orientation change. And that time um, is checked to see uh, whether that's within the range of a normal step. And then that's how we count our steps, essentially. Um, another, one, another really cool innovation is our tightening mechanism itself. So we've got two stepper motors over here relatively cheap and uh, a little bit weak, to be honest. So we've got a pulley system here that amplifies the force to get adequate compression um, on the posters right there on the bottom. Uh, and that's all, again, 3D printed pieces, just like the casing. Now, the final, uh, the final innovation that we've done is our own custom application here. I think Jacob's going to take it away and show us exactly how it works. So our smartphone application is divided into two main parts. The top half, as you can see, is the Hax controller that enables you to tighten and loosen the, the device. Uh, the bottom half is a live feedback of the key parameters that we're measuring here for the recovery process, such as the compression status, which, tell, which tells you if it's safe or unsafe, uh, the temperature uh, in Celsius that's constantly live uh, updating, and the elev elevation status, whether it's not elevated or not, and how many steps you've taken using the, our own pedometer that we've made. Um, so, um, yeah, that's it. Hello, I'm Peter, and my partners are Sammy and Anush. We've developed a non-invasive device for stroke patients who, which detects strokes and trans ischemic attacks as they happen. Ischemic attacks are strokes which occur when a cerebral artery is blocked by an embolus, and symptoms can include drowsiness and slurring of speech. Transient ischemic attacks, or TIAs, are the same physiological event, but the clot dissolves and the symptoms pass after two hours. Pa stroke patients are often unsure of their own diagnosis using the FAST method, and they... Yeah, sorry. We're using the FAST method, and this can cause them to delay or not seek treatment. Uh, so FAST treatment can help prevent brain injury in the case of stroke, and in the case of TIAs, getting to the hospital after an attack can help prevent future strokes. Yeah. 
So this is our prototype right here. Uh, basically, we use a ultrasound probe to detect for changes in the blood flow, and we use a pulse oximeter to look for fibrillation in the BPM. So our device puts together those two diagnostic information to provide a quantitative rapid diagnosis, and it uses a Bluetooth connection to send that to a Bluetooth app, which basically directs the user uh, to the diagnosis. And if a clear diagnosis, diagnosis was made, it directs them to seek medical attention. We can give you guys a quick demo right now. So right now we're using, uh, we're feeding our own signals into the device itself, uh, just to keep our our uh, our results uh, consistent with uh, throughout the day. So let's start. Yep. Okay. All right. So we're gonna play a phantom signal right now. Three, two, one. And I uh, just hit on in the app, so it's recording. It takes a 20 second sample. Our uh, healthy data was we placed the pulse oximeter on a finger and held our ultrasound sensor up to the carotid artery here. Normally, it would be placed on the mid cerebral artery on the side of the head, but our ultrasound probe cannot work transcranially. Yep. So you can see that it uh, looked at both the signals and it gave a signal that both conditions were detected and they should see the doctor. All right, so we're Will Yakub and Shannon, and our product was the exercise monitor, monitor with muscle activation. Uh, it's called a run track. Uh, the purpose of our device is to measure ex um, step count, heart rate, and muscle activation in the leg of the user. Um, it's designed for cyclists and runners, endurance athletes. Uh, so that they can get real-time feedback on an app to their phone via Bluetooth uh, that tells them if their muscles are activating optimally or suboptimally. And in case, in the case that they are acting suboptimally, they can either rest or slow down in order to prevent injury um, to the user. And we decided to go with this because our, we looked into the Fitbit or muscle or exercise monitor market, and we found that Although units are still selling great, Fitbit sold 5 million last year, the market is sort of stagnant with no new features really being offered in new devices. So the way our product works is it integrates um, data taken from our custom code and sends that signal to our EMG detector, accelerometer, and pulse sensor. And then that sends back to the Arduino. And the Arduino provides a feedback for the, um, for the pulse in either the healthy range, the potentially dangerous range, or the dangerous range, and that's in the form of LED lights. And then we also have Bluetooth connectivity that relays the information for muscle activation, the pulse, and um, the accelerometer in the form of a step counter. And the way that works is we have custom code that transfers the X, Y, and Z components taken by the accelerometer into a step counter for the heart rate we are measuring the time between peaks in muscle contract uh, in contraction, sorry, and that is being transmitted into uh, beats per minute. And then for EMG, we're storing um, ac muscle activation in a threshold region within an array, and then we're taking changes from that threshold region over a period of time. And if there's a change of below five percent then there's still optimal, but if there's a change of above 5% and decrease in muscle activation, then we're showing that there's muscle fatigue. Currently, there are a number of companies out there like Fitbit, Apple, Garmin, and Samsung that sell wearable fitness tracking devices. Uh, these are giant companies that dominate the market with their, with their large uh, marketing departments, capital, and worldwide connections. However, none of these companies provide a wearable tracking device. Uh, in fact, there are only a few small competitors that actually do provide lifetime EMG tracking. Uh, the problem with these companies is that they are trying to develop a full suit to measure EMG activation all over the body. But the problem with this is that these suits can cost over $1,000 and are very unaffordable to the general consumer. Uh, our preliminary prototype can be manufactured for around $25 and we are aimed to, selling, or we are aimed to sell at a price of around $229. This will allow us to make a great profit margin while still providing an affordable product for our consumer. 
According to Forbes, the wearable fitness tracking market is expected to be worth up to $25 billion in 2019. And between 2015 and 2019, sales of wearable fitness tracking devices is expected to increase by up to 150 million units per year. Uh, this shows that customers are ready to buy new functionally advanced devices similar to ours. Uh, and this is a great time for our company to get into the market, grab a piece of the pie and establish ourselves. Uh, to get our product from the ground and into the hands of consumers, we need an investor to cover the preliminary marketing and manufacturing costs. Uh, next, we need to contact stores that sell tech products like Best Buy to see if they'd be interested in uh, selling our product in their stores. Uh, if this is a success, we can begin manufacturing and distributing our product around the world. We aim to market our device in locations where we think people would benefit most from our uh, wearable EMG tracker. So places like Canada and the United States is a good place to start as there are millions of people that regularly run, bike, and do any other types of exercise. Um, so with our proposed manufacturing and marketing strategy, we believe that we can sell uh, a successful product around the world. So we'll do a little uh, demonstration. So right now I have the EMG <laughs> electrodes hooked up. I have one on my ground node and I have two ones further up on my uh, quad muscle. I have a heart rate, pulse sensor, and just, hello YouTube. Uh, and then my step counter is uh, inside the little wearable pouch here. So now we'll do a little demonstration with our, our app. Do you wanna unlock that? So basically I'll, I'm just gonna do some, some like squats to simulate some Step counting. So it's connecting to our Bluetooth app, hopefully. Come on. And, and we might have, this is not coming through, we might have, it's connected to the Bluetooth, but we might have had a little loose connection, so our data isn't coming through from the serial monitor. But basically, it prints out the steps counted, the beats per minute, uh, and if you're in optimal or like weak muscle activation ranges. So, yeah.